million things to get into here today, most of them not good. We have the death of Bobby Eaton, which just came out a few moments ago. Jody Hamilton passed away. Burt Prentice passed away. Let's start with Bobby Eaton. Yeah, that's pretty sad news. Bob, he hadn't been in good health for years. But um, Bobby Eaton was a super nice guy and um, fantastic in-ring wrestler. If he was if he was wrestling now, uh, I mean, he was a big, big star when he wrestled then. But if he was wrestling now, he'd be an even bigger star because he'd be working with better people and it would it would have elevated his game to a an even bigger level and he was because he was so talented and um he probably would have been a major single star um somewhere uh just based on his work alone and i mean the big thing for him was was jim Cornette. i mean because when you know as good as bobby was in that era so much of your game depended on interviewing and Bobby wasn't much of a of an interviewer. He was a shy guy, and but Jim Cornette was one of the great talkers of all time. And when you put the two together, you know, with Jim Cornette with um, managing the Midnight Express, which was you know Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry, and later Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, it was one of the greatest tag team acts that there's ever been. Um, and um, you know, but Bobby, I mean, a lot of people don't know. I mean, Bobby Bobby was always a wrestling fan in Alabama. And he was trained by Tojo Yamamoto, and he started for working for Nick Goulas, and um, he started at the bottom and moved his way. He was so talented. I mean, um, you know, Bobby was probably main eventing, you know, I don't know, by, he started at 17, he was probably main eventing by 19 or 20, I would think, because he was having, like, sensational matches with Randy Savage um, before Randy Savage went to ICW. And um, he, you know, w- was formed a um, couple of tag teams in in for Nick Goulas, including the Jet Set, which was, I guess, his first big break as a babyface tag team with George Goulas, who was Nick's son, who was not a good wrestler whatsoever. And Bobby was fantastic. So Bobby basically carried the team, and they were the top babyface tag team in that territory. And Bobby eventually left, went to other places. Um, I I had known of Bobby, uh, but I think the first I saw of him would have been, um, I didn't see him in his, uh, originally in um, Tennessee. I wasn't getting tapes yet uh, for, is when he was started working for Jarrett. Um, but I saw him in Georgia Championship Wrestling where he held the TV title, and he was not really pushed, but he was there, and he was a super worker. I mean, that was the one thing. is like I'd watch him, and, and I was just like amazed. He was one of the best in the world, but he wasn't really getting a push. I mean, he would win his television matches. He was not a squ- guy who would get squashed, but he mostly worked underneath, sometimes the middle. Uh, wasn't beating the top stars or anything like that. Not really pushed as a top star, but an incredible worker always. Um, you know, probably an incredible worker. Like I said, was still a teenager, and then um, from there he went back to uh, work for Jarrett, and that's when he and Coco Ware became a tag team. Um, they actually first feuded. Bobby was working as a single, Coco as a, as a heel. Bobby was a, Coco was a baby face. Then um, I don't know, Coco probably lost a lose leave town match. I think I don't even know, but he he started wrestling as Sweet Brown Sugar and he turned heel. So they put him and Bobby as a team, and they were one of the best tag teams in the world. They were amazing. I remember watching the matches then. You know, with them with um, fabulous ones. You know, which of course one of them was Stan Lane, who later became his tag team partner, and various different other things but i just remember watching those tapes of the mid-south coliseum matches with bobby eaton i saw him with jerry lawler this (laughs) this this stuff was you know um in tag teams with lawler maybe with dutch mantel perhaps but um i just remember watching him work with lawler was incredible and him work with just anyone just the stuff he did in the ring the creativity his bump taking his offense just had it all just incredible wrestler and then he was working that territory, and then that's when the big thing happened in uh, 82, 
when Mid-South Wrestling, Watts' territory was down for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, Junkyard Dog was not drawing that big with, uh, I believe it was Kamala, because you know, they were having horrible matches. I remember seeing one, oh, fuck, those were sleep-inducing. They would have really good undercards, and they'd have these main event that you'd just put you to sleep. And, um, you know, what you know watts brought in watts was couldn't figure out what was wrong you know even though if he watched his own card and watched the main events maybe he would have figured it out but you know he they, they jyd had been such a big draw that it's hard to blame him you know and he was never a good wrestler but the problem was with jyd was working with good wrestlers and when he was with kamala he wasn't working with a good wrestler anymore um and he was also getting really out of shape so it was a combination of things but anyway watts brought in jerry jarrett and jerry lawler and just come to the territory figure out what's wrong and you know they jerry jarrett gave him his basic advice was you've got all these big guys these big mean guys and you got nobody to draw women and all your big guys wrestled you know the big guy style and you just need more of a variety so as part of one of the as the deal they they agreed that they would switch out a lot of talent they made kind of like informal trades and um one of the things that uh jared pushed on him was jim Cornette because jim Cornette was managing but he could never be the top manager in memphis because they had jimmy hart and he just pushed Cornette on him and they made a tag team dennis Condry and randy rose and norvell austin were the original midnight express in uh, Alabama and they took the name the Midnight Express and it was they sent Condry Dennis Condry super wrestler and Bobby Eaton who was even better than Dennis and made them the Midnight Express and they were one of the greatest tag teams of all time you know like you know as far as American tag teams go I mean right at the top of the top you know I mean like top you could argue the best um, you could make the argument that they're the best uh, I don't know if like, you know, when you say all time, the problem with all time is, is that you're talking all time, you know, like in their era, in their era from 93 to 90, they were the best tag team in wrestling. I mean, were they, you know, can you compare them to Stevens and Patterson? Can you compare them to teams now? I mean, you know, it's, it's not a fair comparison, but they're in the, they're in the same breath with those guys. Um, and they went to Louisiana and between Cornette's mouth and their work uh, they were immediate hit crowds went way up and then they really made their name with the the last stampede which was uh, Bill Watts and JYD under a mask of Stagger Lee going against uh, the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette as the manager and I saw two of those I saw one of them live and then I saw the Superdome one on tape but the one I saw live in Oklahoma City, uh, so the Superdome match was much better than the Oklahoma City match because um, Bill Watts, I think, tore his hamstring in the Superdome match. But whatever it was when we were in Oklahoma City, this is like a week or two later when they did the, you know, they, they did it in every city. And it was the biggest two weeks in the history of that territory, and they never equaled it again. I mean, it was just every building you know watts had retired he came out of retirement after the midnight express he 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 was an announcer and he just couldn't handle cornet you know because cornet just rubbed him the wrong way and he finally slapped cornet and cornet has this pirouette bump which was just incredible and then bobby and dennis beat up bill watts and bill watts recruited stagger lee to be his partner and watts said that uh He's not here for a long feud. He's just here for one match, which was, they did one match in every city. And it was the last stampede. So the idea was it was going to be Bill Watts coming out of retirement for the last time. Although it worked so well that Bill Watts came out of retirement several other times. I remember Bosch telling me the first time was inspired. The second time was okay. The third time was overkill. Because by the third time Watts came out of retirement, it didn't draw at all. But the first time which was this one was the you know they sold out you know houston was they sold out oklahoma city i was in oklahoma city there was probably fifteen thousand people i mean complete sellout of the old myriad center uh the superdome was um twenty 
5,000 people, and they did like in the $180,000 range gate. It was the biggest, I think it was either the biggest or the second biggest gate. It was the second biggest attendance at the Superdome until the, the Attitude Era came, you know, with uh, WCW, I, I think actually um, may have broken it um, for, for, you know, um, when they were just on fire. But, um, um, and they may not have, but, you know, they did do um, WrestleManias at the Superdome that broke that record. So I think it actually, I don't know if they if WCW broke it, and, and it wasn't until WrestleMania, but um, it was, uh, you know. So the, the New Orleans match was really pretty great, and that's all due to Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry being such a great team. Um, the whole idea of the match was, I mean, it wasn't, this thing where you beat down somebody in this and that it was just bill watts throwing punches and them flying everywhere and boy those guys could fly everywhere i mean it was not you know no heat no nothing it was just bill watts came to kick ass for 20 minutes jyd basically fell asleep in the corner didn't do a thing um and i mean it was you know, every punch he threw, the place went crazy because they bumped like crazy for him. So then they come to Oak City, which is the one that I saw, and that was it was it was even a decent match, which tells you how good Bobby was and Dennis, but it wasn't that good because Bill, like I said, had tore his hamstring already by the time they got there. JYD was just hopeless by this point. I mean, like you got Bill Watts with a torn hamstring and like in a 20 minute match, he's probably working 16 minutes of the match with the torn hamstring. And he's throwing the punches, but with the torn hamstring, he can't even move his legs. So the punches or these arm punches look terrible and they're just flying all over because he's the boss anyway. And I mean, it got over, you know, it really did get over huge, but but it didn't look so great at all. Um, I mean, it was it was kind of sad watching. You know, it was sad because Bill couldn't move, and those guys had to just bump for him, and they did. You know, and um, so that was where Bobby and Dennis and Cornette really made their big reputation in the business because the business your reputation was made when you drew money, and these guys that act drew money. They remained you know mid-south remained hot they worked you know with all the different you know rock that's where the rock and roll express feud started shortly after that they worked with the rock and roll express they worked with the fantastics um um they worked with some wrestling too and uh uh magnum ta and various other teams in in uh mid-south everything was great rock and roll express matches were great fantastics matches were great um they went to Dallas, not as good there because they put them in the middle. They worked great matches with the Fantastics, but they really didn't put them with the Von Erics. Um, so Dallas was kind of like uh, nothing. And then they um, went to Crockett and, uh, you know, basically were remembered for, you know, the Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, Fantastics again, uh, Southern Boys, you know, just all these incredible matches. Um, and... You know the 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 problem was I mean they 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 were there for for years when the transition came and Crockett sold to Turner Broadcasting and Jim Hurd was put in charge he didn't really like like he knew Bobby was good don't get me wrong but he didn't really get Bobby and Cornette and Jim Hurd used to get into arguments all the time because you know. He didn't really get tag teams because Hurd grew up on St. Louis and the tag teams were never really featured. It was always singles main events or almost always. Um, and they didn't do those kind of tag teams as headliners. So he didn't see it that way because of how he grew up on wrestling. And Cornette was mad because he didn't see it that way. And Hurd thought that, um, you know, Jim Cornette was fantastic, a uh, great talker. And he just didn't, you know, he, he knew Bobby was a great worker, but he didn't want to feature him because he just thought that Bobby didn't have the charisma. And so, you know, it, it led to issues. At one point, he was thinking of, like, not offering Bobby much money and things like that. And, you know, they got Bobby a job. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, as far as like they, they, they got him a decent um, amount of money to stay. 
And after the Midnight Express, I mean, he did work with um, the Dangerous Alliance because Paulie, of course, loved Bobby. Everybody loved Bobby. I mean, and, and, and more pragmatically, Bobby and Arn, you know, were a great tag team. And um, then uh, Bobby with uh, Stephen Regal, William Regal, were a great tag team. And then what happened was the bumps caught up with Bobby, you know, um, by the mid nineties and, and, you know, he did the modern style before it was the modern style. He was up there, um, doing big move after big move after big move, taking big bump after big bump, you know, um, I mean, he would come off the top rope multiple times in matches, which back then, like everybody, you know, you didn't have the judgmental bullshit that you have now, but there were old timers who just thought, you know, like how, why, you know, it's stupid to come off the top rope more than once. And why is he doing all these, you know, because Bobby, his basic TV squash match, if you ever watch, it was finishing move, finishing move, finishing move. He'd pick the guy up at two or the guy would kick out. It was just Bobby doing every crazy move he could come up with or Cornette could come up with him because Cornette came up with a lot of the moves um, with Dennis. And I mean, they were, you know, it was just moves, you know, I mean, not that they, when they would go on the big shows, I mean, they made the moves mean something. It wasn't like they were doing moves for the sake of moves, but it was just, you know, this big move and this big move and this big move and off the top rope with the leg and off the top rope with the knee and off the top rope with the elbow and all of his top rope moves he freaking flew like randy savage and even better and um in time you know that was going to catch up with his knees and his hips those elbows off the top and and the knee off the top and the leg drop on your spine off the top and the he, he called the cornet called the hemorrhoid hop and it's like all that stuff over and over again you got to remember that he's probably working 250 300 nights a, a year and, and doing this and he'd been doing this same stuff with brandy savage 10 years earlier and it just caught up with him and um you know that's pretty much what um you know where his career went down was just due to the injuries and he just the body couldn't take it anymore and after wrestling i mean everybody liked him wwe you know hired him he he drank he you know he was a drinker that didn't help his cause uh probably didn't help his health um he, but you know for the last many years he'd had a lot a lot of health problems but um everybody freaking liked bobby the nicest guy in the world and giving in the ring i mean he's the guy like anyone who worked with him that guy made them them look i mean bobby made himself look great but he made his opponent look great too he was a fantastic worker you know one of the best tag teams you know with the midnight express but every tag team that i mentioned was a great tag team the coco Ware tag team was so underrated the r and tag team you know was was um look you got two super workers in there uh he came with it when stan lane came in it was the the new midnight express that was more charismatic than the old midnight express and you know stan was good but you know anyone who teamed with bobby is going to be in one of the best tag teams in the world the guy was just an incredible incredible wrestler um in his time i mean like back then i mean it was rick flair it was bobby barry windham maybe kurt hennig later on was of that caliber maybe adrian adonis in some ways was of that caliber but i mean that was it you know i mean he was ahead of everybody else um you know i mean um, maybe not everyone in japan but but as far as united states wrestling goes um he was just a super worker did you did you ever meet him i never met him no oh, okay but i watched a ton of his matches and uh he was fantastic oh. Even today, if you watch his matches, those those Men Express matches, they hold up. Because I remember when um, it was when the uh, Young Bucks wrestled Hangman and um, Kenny Omega in the match of the year last year, and that I thought was maybe the best tag match I ever saw. And then um, I had to go on a spree of watching Midnight Express and Fantastics and and uh, um, what was the uh, the um, Kawada and Tawe and Misawa and Kobashi matches and. Um, uh, I mean, they were all the same. They were all off. They were all fantastic. But, my, you know, the Midnight Express fantastic matches watched with today's eyes. I mean, there's, 
it's still a five star match. I mean, it's it you know, and a lot of the stuff back then when I watch it, it's like not as good now as this. You know, it doesn't hold up. That's such a bullshit thing to say. It doesn't hold up, even though everyone says it. It's just different times. You're working for different crowds and it's different style. But that style that they did would would still be fantastic today. Like his style was timeless because it was, like I said, he was this. He was doing this style of wrestling uh, 20 years before this style came in vogue. And that's why I say that if he was around now, he would be viewed even better than he was viewed back then. And also because the fans are more sophisticated, so much more sophisticated now. And a guy like that, you know, it wouldn't be and, and, you know, it wouldn't be one of those things where, well, he doesn't have natural charisma and he doesn't have, you know, whatever he doesn't do great promos so therefore he can't get past this spot and you can't really push him you know i mean i guess vince would probably still have that attitude and i i wonder i don't i don't know i don't know that if he if he was in today's wwe that he would be that big of a star um i don't think so but if he was in AEW or on the indies or in in new japan um absolutely absolutely without work rate against you know okada and tanahashi and those guys oh you know he he would be just freaking incredible with, with in, in wrestling today. Hey, if you're a big fan of Wrestling Observer Radio, we got 12,000 episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website, WrestlingObserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week, you can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work. Working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com. 12,000 audio shows at your fingertips.